Objects tell us stories about the past and by studying and recreating them, they help build our knowledge about those who came before. Join us here at Pottsgrove Manor as we talk with skilled artisans who share what they have learned as they work in remaking the past. Can you give us a 30 second summary of who you are and what kind of reproductions you make? Sure, my name is Lynn Otto. I was born and raised in a little town of Higgins, Pennsylvania in Schuylkill County. Um, graduated uh, Tri Valley High School and went to Waynesport Area Community College. And then for the next 41 years of my life, I worked in the steel industry and I retired in 2014. Um, I've been a reenactor since uh, 1984, I believe, and um, uh, have, have really enjoyed the living history uh, world. Um, I, currently, right now, I'm the treasurer on the board of the Conrad Weiser uh, Homestead in Momelsdorf, and I've been able to uh, volunteer at many um, different historic sites like Potts Grove. Um, and uh, I I dabble in making powder horns, but also uh, some of the different containers that you can make uh, out of horn, just not the powder horn itself. Uh, so that's pretty much what I've, what I've been doing. Is there an original piece that first sparked your interest in learning how to make things out of horn? Yes, it was a very, very interesting, and I'll, I'll make it a short story, but in the early 90s, uh, my wife and I were visiting uh, the Washington Crossing, Washington Crossing Museum on the New Jersey side. And we walked into the museum and we were looking at the displays. And this man walked into the museum and had what it looked like appeared to be a sock in his hand. And here it was a uh, authentic French and Indian War map horn that he had brought in for uh, Mr. Swan to evaluate. They were evaluating this horn right in the middle of the museum. So I obviously moseyed over and looked and listened to what they said. And it was indeed a, 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 a map horn. And I believe it was from uh, Fort William Henry. But the biggest part was after they were done talking, Mr. Swell, a swan um, turned to me and he said, would you like to hold this? <laughs> so I got to hold this. Uh, authentic map horn from Fort William Henry, and I was just, I was just amazed. And I think that was the aha moment. And I thought, this is pretty cool. So, is there something that really surprised you as you started to study these original objects and like really changed how you understood and thought? I guess I was. Uh, one of the things that I was really struck with was uh, the 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 natural color of some of the uh, original 18th century horns. Um, you know, today um, there are some uh, great horn makers who are asked to antique the horn to make it look old. And uh, I, I guess uh, my mentor in this uh, doing powder horns, this secret solution that he had to age, and ho uh, age a horn, uh, which he never gave to me. But I, uh, I, was, I was struck by just a different colors of, of a 250 year old horn. And um, I think that was um, one of the things that, st that st stood out to me. And the also thing was the thing was um, that after 250 years, these pieces have become pretty fragile. Um, so they have to be handled with care. Initially, when, when you make a powder horn, it's pretty well indestructible um, unless you would actually throw it into a fire. Um, there are many uh, uh, 18th century horns that have been repaired uh, more than one time. Um, so they are, they are a very, very tough, uh, a tough thing to break. And, um, you know, the, the one enemy that they have uh, throughout the years is insect damage. And once that starts, it does weaken the horn. Can you tell me what role like museums play as you do your research and learn more about powder horns? For the last maybe 10 or 15 years, um, powder horns has really taken a step up as far as artifacts and recognizing number one, the beauty, but the value of them. So almost any museum, like for instance, uh, Fort Ticonderoga or um, uh, 
um, Deerfield Museum, um, always has a great display of, of horns. And uh, it, it is really, really cool just to sit or, or stand and, and look at all of these horns. The one thing about viewing a, a piece in a museum is it's stationary and you can't always get to look at the whole thing. So that's one thing that uh, I wish we could remedy somehow, but I, I understand that it has to be a static display. Can you take us through the process of making one of these? Sure. Um, you obviously have to start off with a raw horn and you're seeing a raw horn here, just my and it is, uh, you could say, directly off the animal. Um, the outer shell of the horn is, is carotene, I like your fingernail substance. Um, so that's on the outside. The inside actually has a living membrane in when it's on the animal. And once the horn is detached, that membrane remains. So you have two options uh, to get that core out. Uh, one, boil it uh, and it will pop out or put it up somewhere high and dry for about a year and uh, it will pop out itself and then you're ready to go. But obviously, uh, it this takes some work. So to get uh, a really nice finish and some carving done, uh, you would start out with something like this. It's a scraper to start scraping down. Um, then you would have to put... Uh, a hole in here, put the powder in and out. And also you would have to put a plug back here. So here is a horn that's already done. So the uh, hole there, um, you could use what it's called a gimlet to drill that hole. Now the other, other uh, Part of the end of the horn. Um, most horns, when you get them, are not totally circular. So you have to make a decision. Do you want to use the horn as is, or do you want to force the horn into something that is round so that you can use um, something like that for the back end? Or do you want to actually uh, trace it as, as the shape is and make it out of this? So that's a decision that you make. And then uh, once it's a solid piece, uh, then you would attach a staple in the back so that you can put your carrying horn in. And you always need something on the small end to be able to keep your strap from um, falling off. So eventually you get to where um, you have a finished powder horn. If you were, if you're going to try to force the end to be circular, then you would uh, put the, the horn in boiling water and boil it and then take it out. And then you would use something like this and force it into the horn until it is shaped around that. And horn, you, you can change the shape of horn by heating, whether it be uh, water. Um, some people use uh, uh, peanut oil. Um, but you can force this into eventually becoming round. Now, it may take more than one try because uh, horn does have memory. So you could do this and you could pull this out and this is, looks perfectly round. You pull it out and it goes back to its shape again. So you have to continually be heating and doing this until you get your, your, uh, your shape that you desire. Um, once the core is out and you start shaping, um, you could have a very, very serviceable horn, if need be, in, in eight to 10 hours. Now, if you're going to be very detailed and you want to actually do some engraving on it, obviously that's gonna take longer. Um, I, most of my horns are very plain because I just don't have the artistic ability to engrave you know, figures and all that types of things. But um, it, can't be, it could be a, a longer process, but I'm, I would think that if you're starting uh, from scratch and you're doing something and then eventually want to engrave it, you could get, get it done in probably a week's time. I'm sure, though, your first couple horns will be a little wonky, but you'll still love them. Yeah, my first try at a horn, um, 
I bought, I got some horns from a local butcher and they were, they were really short things and uh, they still had the core in. So I made the mistake of boiling them on my mom's stove in the kitchen. And that was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> so uh, uh, after that, I, I did use the horns. Um, I no longer have those horns because they were terrible, but it was a start. And I learned a big lesson about boiling horns in the kitchen. You've kind of touched on this, but are there other challenges that you've had in studying and making these? I want to be clear, the horns that I make, you're, you're not going to um, mistake them for um, some really, really beautiful horn in a museum. Mine are very plain, um, utilitarian, um, but there are those uh, that I've heard um, I've never come across any of my own of, of that I've seen on my my own, but there are those that make uh, copies of originals, and at so, some point in time they get passed down as originals. So you have to be very wary of of that. And when I make a horn for a person, I tell them up front: this is not a reproduction of a certain one specific horn. It is a, repro a, re a reproduction of an 18th century powder horn. Um, so that's the one thing that uh, I know some years ago, I was up at the reenactment at Fort Niagara and I was walking through the Sutler area and I happened to see a, a really nice powder horn. I picked it up and it was being sold as an original, but I knew the maker of the horn. So yeah, you have to be very careful in that regard. Do you have any suggestions for anyone who's interested in again starting uh, to make their first powder horn? Yes. First, you have to get over the fear of making something, and <laughs> you have to get you have to wear a little bit of a thick skin uh, to take some comments of your first horns from people. Um, I, I learned very very early on that you know there are some people that will critique and say, "Good job." And then those some that will say, well, you know, you could have did this, you could have did that. So uh, don't let that deter you. If you really want to do something, um, start out small, uh, keep working at it. And um, I think in the long run, uh, if you're not satisfying satisfying anybody else, you're satisfying yourself. And I think that's that's one of the biggest goals that you can do when you're making reproductions. I think that advice goes for, yeah, any reproduction too. There's definitely the fear of, you know, is it going to be good enough? But you're right, like you want to learn, you're excited, take that jump. That is definitely the first step. Absolutely. Do you have any really fun story that sticks out in your, you know, yeah, journey making all this? I'm going to say now it's three years ago. Um, the Museum of the American Revolution uh, opened up in Philadelphia in I think 2017. A wonderful, wonderful museum with great artifacts. Um, about two years after they had been open, I got a request from um, one of the, uh, the uh, docents down there um, asking if I would make a powder horn for them for their uh, uh, demonstrations. I was like, whoa, <laughs> I, I was honored, but I, do I really want to do this? Is it going to be good enough? And um, I said something to my wife and she said, no. Go for it. So I did. I, I talked to the, uh, I think it was Tyler Putnam. And I, uh, I, I talked to him and we talked about what he wanted in a horn. And I did it. Um, my wife made the strap for it. And we sent it off and they seemed to be pleased. And I thought, well, good. That's the end of it. About three months later, um, there was a, a, a blurb uh, that had been uh, film a news blurb that had been filmed at the museum um, talking about uh, uh, some of the artifacts and some of the um, the, the uh, displays that they have for for kids to to handle and now this was on I, I believe it was on CBS but as they were talking lo and behold the person that was talking for the museum held up my powder horn and I no, that can't be. And I kept looking and looking. Oh my God, that, that was the horn I made. So that was a that was a pretty cool project. And and to even have it extend that you could I I could actually see it on TV. That was pretty cool. What is the best part 
about this. I mean, your fun story really did help, but yeah, is there a best part about creating all this? Yeah, you know what? Um, it probably happened at Pottsgrove at a uh, in, in a August Living History Day when my wife and I were there. I was doing powder horns, and a uh, I'm gonna guess the boy was about ten years old. He came up to me and said, "What are you making?" And I talked to him and uh, showed him different things, and I could see the sparkle in his eye that this was just not an ordinary. Uh, young man who just came to look and walk away. He was definitely interested. And I, th moments like that, when you see that sparkle in their eye, uh, you know that, yeah, that, that this is why I do this.